Hello travelers, welcome to the Copper Fox Inn. I am Thomas the Human Bard, and this is my show, Inspiration. On this show, I try to give you the tools to build creative and interesting homebrew worlds and narratives for your Dungeons & Dragons games. Today, I'm going to be discussing religion. Now, the easiest way to add a religion to your homebrew world is to take an existing real-world religion, uh, make one or two adjustments, slap a mustache on it, and bada-bing, bada-boom, the Catholic Church. This method is fine, I guess, if you're a coward creating a religion out of another one and saying it's my own. Who do you think I am? King Henry VIII? Come on. Uh, look, I'm a lore bard. If I'm going to create something, I'm going to start from the ground up and I'm going to put all my effort into it. So let's do that. Let's design a religion from the ground up. And let's start with some references. I have to recommend the book The Sacred and the Profane, wherein Mircea Eliade puts forward his belief that hierophanies are the basis of all religion. Now, uh... Mircea Eliade is really influential on the foundations of modern comparative religion and religious studies, but also Mircea Eliade voiced support for the Iron Guard, a group of fascist anti-Semites in the late 1930s. So also, like, f*** this dude, f*** fascism and f*** racism. Um, so, I'm also going to recommend When God Was a Woman by Merlin Stone. Ah, oh, man. Whereas Eliade was, you know, a bad person, Merlin Stone was a hero and a feminist and influential to the goddess movement. And also, her name makes her sound like a wizard spy detective. So what I'm trying to say is that between the two, I'd rather have Merlin over for tea instead. <sighs> read, read this book. With those introductions out of the way, let's start building our religion. Here we go. Religion is founded in human experience. Just like it's impossible to think of a color you've never seen before, you can't make a religion based in experiences you haven't ever had. These experiences are the colors that we'll paint with, but the arrangement of these paints is up to us. Now, with so many different kinds of experiences in human life, how do we choose which ones matter to our religion? One of the things that makes religions feel authentic is a connection to ancient experiences. That's why brand new religions don't get invented very often. They feel inauthentic to us because if a religion was true, then it feels like it should have a history. Preferably a history to the very earliest times, possibly back to the original creation and the original people. So if we build religions out of experiences, we need them to be rooted in ancient experiences. We uh, probably won't end up making a religion based on modern experiences like computers or the stock exchange. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to eventually work things like that into our religion if we want, but it can't be our foundation. The experiences we use must be universal, ancient, and primal. They must be the first experiences people ever had. Here are some examples. When a baby is born, one of its first experiences is light, and conversely, darkness. These are good foundations. That's why they are prevalent themes in every single real-world religion. Some of the first sensory experiences a person has are of their own body, the experience of having limbs, eyes, ears, a mouth. They then use that body to experience warmth, cold, touch, separation, needs like hunger, thirst, and sleep. Once the senses are developed enough, a person can experience the world around them. Ancient people didn't have hospitals or suburban homes, so their very first environment of experience was the natural world. The ground, the sky, the waters, plants, animals, other people, eventually sensory experiences like pain and emotional experiences like fear occur in tandem with joy and safety. These are some of the most fundamental building blocks of religion. The next step is the creation of narrative around these experiences. This will mostly depend on the geographic location of the people having these experiences and the effect that location has on their day-to-day -day life. The relationship that someone dwelling in an arid desert has with warmth will be vastly different from someone who dwells in an icy tundra. For our example today, I'll say that these people dwell on a massive series of uh, tropical islands on a great ocean. 
I'll start off with the experiences of water and sky. So let's build some relationships. Animals live in the water. Storms come from the sky. People live between the water and the sky. The water becomes the place of resources. Fish are hunted, seaweed is harvested, ocean predators are fought. Becoming stranded in a storm is deadly, but dwelling in a boat provides safety. These relationships almost write themselves, but it's not quite enough to create a religion. Now, Eliade believes that the basis of all religion is hierophany, or the manifestation of the sacred to the profane. Man becomes aware of the sacred because it manifests itself, shows itself as something wholly different from the profane. To designate the act of manifestation of the sacred, we have proposed the term hierophany. It is a fitting term because it does not imply anything further. It expresses no more than is implicit in its etymological content, i.e. something sacred shows itself to us. Some event must occur, or be said to have occurred, which is the first manifestation of this sacred world. In our example, we will use a great typhoon. We'll use the primal building blocks in the story of this hierophany to give it authenticity and purpose to these ancient people. There was a great typhoon of darkness. Out of that storm came people. They survived the storm in boats and landed on these islands. When the storm cleared, there was light. The first storm, the first people, the first boats. That storm was the beginning. This is a great foundation, but it's missing an important element. A sacred being or beings. How anthropomorphized that being or beings are is up to you. Um, for ours, I want them to be manifestations of ontological principles, a creator and a destroyer but they will have aspects of anthropomorphic humanoids. This is almost universal, though not completely necessary, this idea of a creator and destroyer, and it's a good place to start. The water is full of all forms of life, providing food, sustenance, and travel to these people. The sky is the source of the great storms that can destroy their boats and dwellings. The deep water will be our creator, and the far sky will be our destroyer. Living close to the water becomes synonymous with life, and living further away from the water becomes synonymous with death. The civilization can now orient their experience of space and time around these beings and their hierophanies. Eliade, again, puts forward an idea of this um, sacred water symbolism throughout all religion. The waters symbolize the universal sum of virtualities. They are fons et origo, spring and origin. The reservoir of all possibilities of existence, they precede every form and support every creation. One of the paradigmatic images of creation is the island that suddenly manifests itself in the midst of the waves. On the other hand, immersion in water signifies regression to the preformal, reincorporation into the undifferentiated mode of pre-existence. Immersion repeats the cosmogonic act of formal manifestation. Immersion is equivalent to the dissolution of forms. The first storm was an act of destruction. People were adrift in the storm. The deep water felt sympathy and from its depths brought up the land and the islands where people could survive the storm. An event like a typhoon would be a negative hierophany, a great disaster or destruction of the world, whereas an event like a beached whale could provide a huge food source and would be seen as a gift of benevolent creation. The next step is to progress the civilization in time and decide how the religion develops and changes to fit a changing culture. Our civilization creates lashed together floating settlements of boats. Children are born in the shallows of the ocean. Navigation becomes more advanced, eventually leading to navigation by stars. The monsoon season is too tough to travel and explore during, so the culture huddles together within their raft cities waiting out the storms. During the fair seasons, they explore and find new settlements on new islands. They don't develop animal husbandry for a long time because their diet almost entirely comes from the ocean. They don't become farmers or shepherds. They become a culture of fishers and explorers. Because bounty comes from the ocean and water is connected with life and birth, eventually the deep water becomes associated with the feminine or the goddess. How gender and sex apply in your religion is up to you, but the experience of procreation and reproduction is almost universal, and because of this, it is intricately connected with religious experience. 
The deep goddess is the source of food and life. Children are born in the water, and the water confers their life. Water is connected with spirit and life force. So conversely, the sky becomes a destroyer, an empty void. Nothing about that experience is particularly connected to maleness. You could argue for the far sky to be genderless even. But for our example, I'll say that the men of this society eventually begin describing the sky as a counterpart to the water, like male is the counterpart to female, and begin applying maleness to the far sky. We can now reframe our original hierophany myth into a true creation myth, an important step in our religion. Here it goes. A man and a woman traveled upon the deep waters. The man was the navigator. He looked at the far sky and used the stars to guide them. The woman was the mariner. She took from the bounty of the deep waters and provided their food. The people loved the deep waters and thanked her for providing for them. The far sky grew jealous, feeling that he was not given proper gratitude for his guidance. Dark clouds gathered, obscuring the stars that he felt the people had taken for granted. The first storm raged. Animals that dwelled in the bosom of the deep were safe, but the first people were adrift, unable to rest within the water. Their boats were tossed upon the waves. Lightning flashed, rain poured down, threatening to capsize their vessel. The deep had compassion, and from her depths rose the first land, a place to find shelter and safety from the wrath of the sky. When the man and woman landed on the island, the storm ceased and the clouds cleared. The sky felt as though it had been robbed of justice, and so demanded that forevermore the people must offer proper gratitude and sacrifice, or else he would remove the stars once again and bring terrible storms to destroy them while they traveled upon the waters. Lacking in food, the people discovered a beached animal after the storm. This great leviathan was an offering from the deep, a great feast given to provide the people with meat for food, oil for heat, and bones to use for the building of weapons and shelter. The people feasted upon the bounty of the deep and created a pact with the sky. The navigator became responsible for the proper appeasement of the sky and the recording of history and knowledge. The mariner became responsible for the gathering of offerings from the deep and the construction of dwellings and ships. Together, they created the first settlement. From this foundational myth, it is not hard to begin creating rituals, rites, and symbols. An annual feast on ocean life to commemorate the Leviathan, with a ritualistic construction of a new boathouse from its bones and a great bonfire from its oil would be obvious. This would occur on perhaps the first full moon after the monsoon season has ended, becoming an eternal return to that first creation. A series of prayers and offerings before journeys to appease the far sky, possibly involving sacred music or other performance, would be good. A generally matriarchal society, where women are the leaders of boats and towns, and men are shamans, would make sense. Holidays would arise around important seasonal dates and historically significant events, such as the discovery of a new island, or the resolution of a feud between two tribal groups. And there it is. That's our creation myth. Not too difficult, huh? Yours might be different, but a lot of the themes will probably be the same. The characters, the locations can all move around, but a lot of the imagery, uh, the metaphor, the symbolism will remain the same. And from this origin myth, um, it's a lot easier to then create rituals, rites, symbolism that spring forth from that instead of working backwards like a lot of people often do. They often come up with an image of what they want their church to look like and then come up with something to support it. We've come up with our foundational creation myth, and now things can spring forward from that. Another important thing to do is that we need to translate this religion into D&D terms. So, in our example, we have an ocean-themed chaotic good deity in the deep waters, and then we have a storm or constellation-themed lawful evil deity in the far sky. Now, there's plenty more fleshing out that we could do with this, um, we could move it forward in time, fill out some more of the rituals and specifics. We could see how it changes to fit a changing culture. 
But if you want to see more of that, let me know down in the comments. I might make another episode. Um, also down below, if you have followed this uh, format to create your own religion, let me know what yours looks like. Did you take, instead of the water and the sky, did you use maybe uh, separation or plants? And that's going to do it for us today. If you want more videos from the Copper Fox Inn, subscribe to our channel, give us a like, um, and send any homebrews that you create to our email, thecopperfoxinn at gmail.com, or we are also on Twitter and Instagram at thecopperfoxinn. Well, I hope this has been inspiring for you, travelers, and until next time, keep on adventuring.